Flat Earth has long been denigrated, derided, and disparaged as being the most crackpot of all conspiracy theories, marginalized, mocked, and ridiculed for centuries as being an ignorant, ancient, unscientific worldview. But the facts of the matter are far from what you have been told. When thoroughly examined and diligently researched with an open mind, any skeptical, critical thinker will find it is actually the tilting, wobbling, spinning spaceball Earth promoted by NASA and taught in schools that is truly ridiculous and unscientific. The following are 20 ways anyone can prove for themselves that Earth is a level, stationary plane. 1. Common Sense It cannot be overstated or overemphasized. The most important thing to realize and most obvious way to know you are not spinning on a ball is your own common sense and lived experience. You have always, and will always, experience yourself as living right side up on a motionless earth, with the sun, moon, and stars revolving over and around you. This is common sense, and what everyone in the world personally experiences every day of their lives. We are taught to believe otherwise, however, many things completely contrary to our own common sense and experience from a very early age. We are told that people living down under the spinning ball earth in Australia are actually living upside down relative to those residing in the northern hemisphere, while an invisible force, strong enough to hold people, buildings, and oceans stuck to the underside of a rapidly rotating ball, but weak enough to allow birds, bugs, and planes to take off and fly with ease, keeps Earth's atmosphere spinning in perfect balance and holds everyone firmly to the surface without crushing us. We can clearly see that the horizon is horizontal, but we are told it curves. We can feel that the Earth under our feet is motionless, but we are told it moves. We can observe the luminaries revolving around us, but we are told it is us that revolves. It is obvious that stars are stars, but we are told that stars are suns. We can see the sun is bigger than the stars, but we are told stars are bigger than the sun. We can see the sun and moon are the same size, but we are told the sun is 400 times larger. It is obvious that up is up and down is down, but we are told there is no such thing. As stated by Flat Earth author David Wardlaw Scott, with the modern astronomer, there is theoretically neither up nor down, though his experience belies his assertion every time he looks up to the heavens or down to the ground. Such aberration of intellect is really to be pitied. The third century philosopher Lacantius was similarly perturbed about the idea, stating, A sphere where people on the other side live with their feet above their heads? where rain, snow, and hail fall upwards, where trees and crops grow upside down, and the sky is lower than the ground? The ancient wonder of the hanging gardens of Babylon dwindle into nothing in comparison to the fields, seas, towns, and mountains that pagan philosophers believe to be hanging from the earth without support. Truly, the idea that people are standing, ships are sailing, and planes are flying upside down on certain parts of Earth, while others are tilted at 90 degrees and all other impossible angles, is utter absurdity and an affront to common sense. In fact, common sense is the first casualty of globe belief. No child or unindoctrinated man would ever conclude or even conceive if given to their own devices, based on their own personal observations, that Earth was a spinning ball revolving around the sun. When children are indoctrinated from a very early age to abandon their common sense and lived experience of a geocentric plain Earth in favor of this nonsensical, heliocentric globe model taught in schools, a schism occurs in their psyche. No longer can they trust their own senses and experience, and instead must trust information completely contrary to it taught by supposed experts and authority figures who insist their version of reality is correct. When children see that every adult around them believes wholeheartedly in the spinning globe, and hear that only our ignorant, unscientific ancestors believed otherwise, 
they readily abandon the empirical evidence of their senses and adopt the prevailing nonsensical model. As stated by Flat Earth author E. S. Sheeney, the one thing the fable of the revolving earth has done, it has shown the terrible power of a lie. A lie has the power to make a man a mental slave, so that he dares not back the evidence of his own senses, to deny the plain and obvious movement of the sun he sees before him, when he feels himself standing on an earth utterly devoid of motion, at the suggestion of someone else, he is prepared to accept that he is spinning furiously round. When he sees a bird flying and gaining over the ground, he is prepared to believe that the ground is really traveling a great number of times faster than the bird. And finally, in order to uphold the imagination of a madman, he is prepared to accuse his maker of forming him a sensiferous lie. 2. Fake Photographs One of the main reasons the average person believes the world is a globe is because of the globular Earth images and video footage provided by NASA and other space agencies. Hundreds of such pictures and thousands of videos featuring a globe Earth are freely available on the internet, yet most people never critically examine them with a skeptical eye. From the earliest photographs to the latest live streams, NASA and the world's other space agencies continue to be exposed for their Hollywood-style trickery. When conscientiously compared, contrasted, and investigated for inconsistencies, it turns out every single image and video showing a globular Earth has been manipulated in some way. All globe videos, for example, are achieved using either a fisheye lens to curve the horizon or created completely through CGI technology. One clear instance of the latter is NASA's 1990 time-lapse video of Earth supposedly filmed by their Galileo Space Telescope from 1.3 million miles away. This video features the Earth globe spinning in space uncut for 25 hours and shows the exact same clouds present without ever dissipating, changing shape or location the entire time. In reality, if you watch clouds in the sky for several minutes, three things will inevitably happen. The clouds will all move, some will morph, gradually changing shape, and others will dissipate and disappear completely. In NASA's official footage of the spinning ball Earth, however, the entire world's cloud cover doesn't dissipate, morph, or move for 25 hours, which is, of course, impossible, and proof of fakery. A good example of fisheye lens fakery is the famous 2012 GoPro Red Bull jump, where skydiver Felix Bumgartner was lifted to a record-breaking 128,000 feet in a stratospheric balloon, then jumped back to Earth. Seven GoPro cameras on the outside of the craft and strapped to Felix himself recorded the entire ascent and descent. Astute observers will notice that from ground level all the way up to the 24-mile apex, the horizon is significantly curved and remains equally so for the entire ascent. This is because the curve is artificial, and being caused by the GoPro camera's standard-issue fisheye lens. Once Felix reaches his peak altitude and the door of his craft opens, an inside camera mounted behind him without a fisheye lens reveals the truth, showing a perfectly flat horizon still at eye level, 128,000 feet high. As for the hundreds of supposed photographs available of the globe, NASA readily admits that these are composite images, and not actual photographs. They claim the composites are made by taking strips of data sent from satellites, spliced together in Photoshop, and colorized for the final creation. NASA's senior program analyst and lead data visualizer, Robert Simmon, admitted in an interview that they are Photoshopped because they have to be. When compared side by side and viewed with a discerning eye, the inconsistencies become obvious. The coloration of the land and oceans, and relative size of the continents, drastically changes between images, and they often feature far too little land mass for 50% of a globe. Several of NASA's blue marble Earth images have repeat instances of exact cloud patterns clearly copied and pasted into place. Computer enhancements done on Earth images taken during the Apollo missions also show similar photo trickery. 
when hues are removed from the black backgrounds and brightness enhanced, distinct rectangular artifacts appear around the globe where they were pasted in, again proving them to be doctored composites. Furthermore, when NASA's Earth pictures are compared with those from the Russians, Chinese, and other space agencies, the differences become evident, and the fact that they are all simply Photoshop images becomes obvious. If NASA and the world's space agencies could provide real, legitimate photographs and videos of a globe, they most certainly would. So the fact that they continue producing and pumping out nothing but fisheye fakery and CGI cartoons is strong evidence that Earth is not what they claim. 3. Water The natural physics of water are that once contained and undisturbed, the surface will always remain horizontal. This fundamental physical property of water is why it has been used as a leveling tool by builders and engineers for millennia. Whether in a bucket, bathtub, pond, lake, or an ocean, the surface of water at rest always remains flat and doesn't have the ability to show convexity or any shape whatsoever upon its surface. This fact is easily demonstrable and empirically verifiable, but completely at odds with what we are told about the globe. For Earth to be globular and over 70% covered in water, the oceans must be somehow curving around and sticking to all sides of a rapidly spinning ball suspended in space. It is simply impossible to make water behave this way, as anyone can experiment for themselves. Bodies of water will not stick to the underside of a ball and cannot show convexity or any other shape upon their surface. Globe defenders will often point to water droplets, meniscus, surface tension, or adhesion, claiming these are examples of water bending or sticking to a surface, which is nothing but a fallacy of false equivalency, as these only happen at a very small scale the size of a coffee cup. The claim is entire oceans wrapping around and sticking to the underside of a spinning ball, not a water droplet or the meniscus in a glass filled to the brim. NASA has also recently taken to faking CGI water balls using augmented virtual reality technology in an attempt to convince the public that water can behave this way. This kind of demonstration, done in a reference frame inaccessible to 99.99% .99 of the population, however, is unrepeatable by the world's scientists and skeptics, and is therefore not scientific or permissible as proof of anything. First, they claim only massive objects the size of Earth have this attractive property. Then, as evidence, they show a phenomenon allegedly outside of our earthly reference frame. In other words, they are claiming bodies of water can bend around, stick to a ball, and show curvature upon their surface, but only at a scale too big for the public to recreate. Then, they are claiming water can ball up and float suspended in air, but only in a reference frame too far for the public to recreate. As for water level, globe defenders have actually attempted to completely redefine the term level just to fit with their dogma. The true definition of level is a flat, horizontal plane with no deviation in elevation along its surface. Water always reliably seeks and maintains its own level, and that is why it has been used in spirit levels and construction projects from time immemorial to create perfectly horizontal structures, no matter their size. Globe zealots, however, unsatisfied with this obvious truth and clear definition, have attempted to redefine level to instead mean curved. Their globe-friendly version of level means equal heights around a ball when measured from a central point. The fact of the matter is, however, that nobody has ever reached this hypothetical center point of the hypothetical Earth globe, so their redefined term cannot be tested or falsified. Until that day, rest assured there is good reason we call it sea level and not sea curve. 4. The Horizon The horizon is always perfectly horizontal, 360 degrees around the observer, regardless of altitude. If Earth was actually a globe, no matter how large, as an observer ascended, the horizon would remain fixed in position and fall below the observer the higher climbed. In reality, all amateur balloon, rocket, plane, and drone footage 
filmed without a fisheye lens, at maximum altitudes of over 20 miles high, show a completely flat horizon still rising to eye level. Only in NASA and other space agency footage does the horizon ever curve or appear below the observer's eye level. In the heliocentric model, the horizon is claimed to be the physical curvature of their globe, and the reason boats receding from a shorebound observer disappear from view. This was actually one of the original alleged globe Earth proofs presented by Aristotle and still parroted by believers today. But by using modern zoom technology, we now know that the horizon is not the physical curvature of a globe, and those boats can be zoomed back into full view. This is because the horizon is not an objective, physical phenomenon at all, but rather a subjective, optical phenomenon, based on an individual observer's perspective. If the horizon was actually the objective, physical curvature of a globe, then objects receding beyond it could not be zoomed back into view, and it would remain fixed as an observer ascended. In reality, however, the horizon rises along with the observer no matter how high, and modern zoom technology can bring objects receding beyond it back into full view. This proves the horizon line is not some objective point of curvature on a convex earth, but rather the subjective vanishing line of perspective from a given observer's point of view. Quoting Earth Not a Globe by Dr. Samuel Robotham, On the shore near Waterloo, a few miles to the north of Liverpool, a good telescope was fixed, at an elevation of six feet above the water. It was directed to a large steamer, just leaving the River Mercy and sailing out to Dublin. Gradually the masthead of the receding vessel came nearer to the horizon, until, at length, after more than four hours had elapsed, it disappeared. The ordinary rate of sailing of the Dublin steamers was fully eight miles an hour, so that the vessel would be at least thirty-two miles distant when the masthead came to the horizon. The six feet of elevation of the telescope would require three miles to be deducted for convexity, which would leave twenty-nine miles, the square of which, multiplied by eight inches, gives five hundred and sixty feet, deducting eighty feet for the height of the main mast, and we find that, according to the doctrine of rotundity, the masthead of the outward-bound steamer should have been four hundred and eighty feet below the horizon. Many other experiments of this kind have been made upon sea-going steamers, and always with the results entirely incompatible with the theory that the Earth is a globe. 5. Gyroscopes Gyroscopes are precision instruments consisting of a wheel mounted inside two or three gimbals which provide pivoting support and allow the wheel to rotate about a single axis. As the entire contraption moves and shifts angles, the gimbals move and shift accordingly, but the inner wheel never changes its angle with respect to its initial reference frame. This unique property is called rigidity in space, meaning the inner wheel maintains its orientation and axis of rotation in relation to space and not to the surface of the earth. This means that the base of a gyroscope set in motion with its axis in a vertical position, then placed on a table for six hours should rotate 90 degrees with the spinning globe Earth. As the globe turns under the gyroscope for six hours, the axis should slowly turn from vertical to horizontal. This experiment has been tested many times with several full-length videos available online, and never does the gyroscope's vertical axis shift whatsoever. If the heliocentric model were true, not only would the gyroscope detect the alleged thousand-mile-per-hour spin of the globe, but also the 67,000 mile per hour revolution around the sun, the entire solar system's 500,000 mile per hour spiral around the Milky Way galaxy, and the entire galaxy's multi-million mile per hour journey through the universe. Since these hypothetical motions never register on precision gyroscopes, it is clear that they, just like the spinning ball Earth they're based on, do not exist. Gyroscopes are also the technology behind inertial guidance systems and airplane artificial horizon indicators. When military jets are performing loops, barrel rolls, and other dogfighting maneuvers, the artificial horizon allows pilots to easily see their exact orientation 
relative to Earth without having to rely on looking out the window. If Earth was truly a sphere, by simply flying level, airplane artificial horizon indicators should show a steady decline unless pilots constantly correct their altitudes downwards so as not to fly straight off into so-called outer space. For example, a pilot traveling 500 miles per hour over a globe Earth 24,900 miles in circumference would have to descend an average of 2,777 feet, or over half a mile per minute. Otherwise, in one hour's time, the plane would be 31.5 miles higher than desired. In fact, if Earth was really a ball, there should be no reason to use rockets for flying into outer space, because simply flying an airplane straight at any altitude for long enough would already inevitably send you there. 6. Compasses The Mariner's Compass is another precision instrument which can only work on a level plane Earth, and is an impossible and nonsensical tool for use on a globe. It simultaneously points north and south over a flat surface, and must be held flat to work, yet claims to be pinpointing two constantly moving geomagnetic poles at opposite ends of a spinning sphere originating from a hypothetical molten metal core. If compass needles were actually drawn to the north pole of a globe, the opposing south needle would actually be pointing up and off into outer space. Likewise, observers holding a compass in Antarctica would be at the bottom of the ball, so to show north, the needle would have to point down at their feet. If the so-called south pole in Antarctica were truly the southern pole of a magnet, observers would be able to walk in a circle with their backs to the south pole and have their compass needles show north being in front of them in every direction. This feat has never and will never be achieved because the so-called south pole is simply an arbitrary point along the Antarctic ice marked with a red and white barbershop pole and topped with a little metal ball earth. The actual type of magnetism present on earth is similar to a ring magnet found in loudspeakers, which have a central north pole, with the opposite south pole being all points along the outer circumference. This perfectly describes the magnetism of our flat Earth, whereas the alleged source of magnetism in the globe model is emitted from a hypothetical molten magnetic core in the center of the ball which they claim conveniently causes both poles to constantly move and thus forever evade independent verification at their two ceremonial poles. 7. Plain Sailing Ship captains in navigating great distances at sea never need to factor the supposed curvature of the Earth into their calculations. Both plain sailing and great circle sailing, the most popular navigation methods, use plane, not spherical trigonometry, making all mathematical calculations on the assumption that the Earth is perfectly flat. If the Earth were in fact a sphere, such an errant assumption would lead to constantly glaring inaccuracies. Plain sailing has worked perfectly fine in both theory and practice for thousands of years, and plain trigonometry has time and again proven more accurate than spherical trigonometry in determining distances across the oceans. It is so commonly used at sea, navigation in theory and practice states that, in practice, scarcely any other rules are used but those derived from plain sailing. The great and serious objection to plain sailing is that longitude cannot be found by it accurately, although in practice it is more frequently found by it than any other method. So both latitude and longitude are found most often and most accurately by assuming Earth to be flat, more accurately even than assuming the Earth to be spherical. Quoting 100 Proofs Earth is Not a Globe by William Carpenter, If the Earth were a globe, a small model globe would be the very best, because the truest, thing for the navigator to take to sea with him. But such a thing as that is not known. With such a toy as a guide, the mariner would wreck his ship of a certainty. This is a proof that Earth is not a globe. 8. Construction Surveyors, engineers, architects, and builders are never required to factor the supposed curvature of the Earth into their projects. Plumb bobs are used to establish plumb vertical datums, 
with spirit levels then used to establish horizontal datums and lay flat foundations across great expanses. If Earth was actually a globe of given proportions, builders would find themselves constantly deviating from both their established vertical and horizontal datum lines. But in reality, canals, railways, bridges, tunnels, and other large projects are always cut and laid horizontally, often over hundreds of miles, without any allowance for curvature, and no deviation from established datums. As stated by surveyor T. Westwood in Earth Review magazine, quote, In leveling, I work from ordnance marks, or canal levels, to get the height above sea level. The puzzle to me used to be that over several miles, each level was and is treated throughout its whole length as the same level from end to end, not the least allowance being made for curvature. The Suez Canal, which connects the Mediterranean Sea with the Gulf of Suez on the Red Sea, is one clear proof of both the Earth's and water's non-convexity. The canal is a hundred miles long and without any locks, so the water within is an uninterrupted continuation of the Mediterranean Sea to the Red Sea. When it was constructed, the Earth's supposed curvature was not taken into account. It was dug along a horizontal datum line 26 feet below sea level, passing through several lakes from one sea to the other, with the datum line and the water's surface running perfectly parallel over the hundred miles. Another good example is the Dunyang Kunshan Bridge, the longest bridge in the world, just over 102 miles long, which runs parallel to the Yangtze River and connects the Shanghai and Nanjing provinces. This bridge is approximately the same length as the Suez Canal, and was also built without factoring the alleged curvature of the Earth. If Earth was actually a globe 24,900 miles in circumference, spherical trigonometry dictates that the center of both the Suez Canal and the Dunyang Kunshan Bridge would bulge over 1,666 feet higher than either end. Engineer W. Winkler was published in the Earth Review regarding the Earth's supposed curvature, stating, As an engineer of many years standing, I saw that this absurd allowance is only permitted in school books. No engineer would dream of allowing anything of the kind. I have projected many miles of railways and many more of canals, and the allowance has not even been thought of, much less allowed for. This allowance for curvature means this, that it is eight inches for the first mile of a canal, and increasing at the ratio by the square of the distance in miles. Thus a small navigable canal for boats, say thirty miles long, will have, by the above rule, an allowance for curvature of six hundred feet. Think of that, and then please credit engineers as not being quite such fools. Nothing of the sort is allowed. We no more think of allowing 600 feet for a line of 30 miles of railway or canal than of wasting our time trying to square the circle. Railroads are another example of large-scale construction projects spanning hundreds or even thousands of miles working from an established datum line and without deviating for the entire length. The Manchester Ship Canal Company in an official statement published in Earth Review magazine, confirmed, quote, It is customary in railway and canal constructions for all levels to be referred to a datum which is nominally horizontal and is so shown on all sections. It is not the practice in laying out public works to make allowances for the curvature of the earth. As an example, the London and Northwestern Railway forms a straight line 180 miles long between London and Liverpool. The railroad's highest point, midway at Birmingham Station, is only 240 feet above sea level. But if Earth was actually a globe of given proportions, the 180-mile stretch of rail would form an arc with its center point at Birmingham raising over a mile, a full 5,400 feet above London and Liverpool. A surveyor and engineer of 30 years, published in the Birmingham Weekly Mercury, stated, I am thoroughly acquainted with the theory and practice of civil engineering. However bigoted some of our professors may be in the theory of surveying according to the prescribed rules, yet it is well known amongst us that such theoretical measurements are incapable of any practical illustration. All our locomotives are designed to run on what may be regarded as true levels or flats. 
There are, of course, partial inclines or gradients here and there, but they are always accurately defined and must be carefully traversed. But anything approaching to eight inches in the mile, increasing as the square of the distance, could not be worked by any engine that was ever yet constructed. Taking one station with another, all over England and Scotland, it may be stated that all the platforms are on the same relative level. The distance between eastern and western coasts of England may be set down as 300 miles. If the prescribed curvature was indeed as represented, the central stations at Rugby or Warwick ought to be close upon three miles higher than a cord drawn from the two extremities. If such was the case, there is not a driver or stoker within the kingdom that would be found to take charge of the train. We can only laugh at those of your readers who seriously give us credit for such venturesome exploits as running trains round spherical curves. Horizontal curves on levels are dangerous enough. Vertical curves would be a thousand times worse, and with our rolling stock constructed as at present, physically impossible. 9. Long-Distance Photography we are consistently able to observe objects at incredibly long distances, far beyond what would be possible if Earth was actually a globe of given proportions. By inputting the observer height and distance viewed into an Earth curvature calculator, it is easy to check how much a target should be obstructed on a globe Earth. For example, it is often possible to see the Chicago skyline from sea level, 60 miles away across Lake Michigan. In 2015, after photographer Joshua Nowicki photographed this phenomenon, several news channels quickly claimed his picture to be a superior mirage, an atmospheric anomaly caused by temperature inversion. While these certainly do occur, the skyline in question was facing right side up and clearly seen, unlike a hazy illusory mirage, and on a ball earth 24,900 miles in circumference should be a full 2,400 feet below the horizon. In Genoa, Italy, from only 70 feet above sea level, on clear days, it is possible to see the distant islands of Elba, Gorgona, Caprea, and Corsica, which are 81, 99, 102, and 125 miles away. If Earth was truly a globe of given proportions, all four islands could never be visible for such an observer, and would be hidden behind 3,300, 5,200, 5,600, and 8,700 feet of curved water. From Anchorage, Alaska, at an elevation of 102 feet, on clear days, both Mount Foraker and Mount McKinley can be seen in their entirety, standing straight from base to summit, with the naked eye, from 120 and 130 miles away, respectively. If Earth was really a ball of given circumference, both mountains should be leaning back away from the observer, with the lower half of each mountain completely obstructed from view. Based on verifiable curvature calculations, 7,719 feet of Mount Foraker's 17,400-foot summit and 9,220 feet of Mount McKinley's 20,320-foot summit should be hidden behind a giant bulge of curved globular earth. The current record-breaking longest-distance zoom photograph recently captured Peak Gaspard from Peak the Finistrelles, a whopping 275 miles away, with an observer height of approximately 9,000 feet, from which, based on correct curvature calculations, the entire 12,740-foot mountain should be invisible behind nearly six miles of curved Earth. Even more recently, flat earthers like J. Tolan Media have been filming using infrared zoom cameras at high altitudes to capture lakes, mountains, and other landmarks up to an incredible thousand miles away. If Earth was really a globe the size we are told, many of the landmarks photographed would be hidden behind upwards of 70 miles of curved Earth. 10. Lighthouses The distance from which various lighthouse lights around the world are visible at sea also far exceeds what could be found on a globe of given proportions. For example, the Dunkirk light in southern France, at an altitude of 194 feet, is visible from a boat 10 feet above sea level, 28 miles away. Spherical trigonometry dictates that if Earth was a globe with the given curvature rate, this light should be hidden 
a hundred and ninety feet below the horizon. The Port Nicholson Light in New Zealand is four hundred and twenty feet above sea level and visible from thirty-five miles away, where it should be two hundred and twenty feet below the horizon. The Agero Light in Norway is a hundred and fifty-four feet above high water and visible from twenty-eight statute miles, where it should be two hundred and thirty feet below the horizon. The light at Madras on the Esplanade is 132 feet high and visible from 28 miles away, where it should be 250 feet below the line of sight. The Cordonin light on the west coast of France is 207 feet high and visible from 31 miles away, where it should be 280 feet below the line of sight. The light at Cape Bonavista, Newfoundland is 150 feet above sea level and visible at 35 miles, where it should be 491 feet below the horizon. The lighthouse steeple of St. Boltoff's Parish Church in Boston is 290 feet tall, and visible from over 40 miles away, where it should be hidden a full 800 feet below the horizon. The Isle of Wight Lighthouse in England is 180 feet high, and can be seen up to 42 miles away a distance at which modern astronomers say the light should fall 996 feet below the line of sight. The Cape Lagulas Lighthouse in South Africa is 33 feet high, 238 feet above sea level, and can be seen for over 50 miles. If the world was a globe, this light would fall 1,400 feet below an observer's line of sight. And finally, the lighthouse at Port Said, Egypt, at an elevation of only 60 feet, has been seen an astonishing 58 miles away, where according to modern astronomy, it should be 2,182 feet below the line of sight. 11. Impossible Atmosphere If Earth was truly a globe, constantly spinning eastwards at over a thousand miles per hour, it stands to reason that helicopters and hot air balloons should be able to simply hover over the surface of the Earth and wait for their destinations to come to them. For example, during the Red Bull Stratosphere Dive, Felix Baumgartner, spending three hours ascending over New Mexico, should have landed 2,500 miles west into the Pacific Ocean, but instead actually landed a few dozen miles east of the takeoff point. Likewise, vertically fired cannonballs and other projectiles should fall significantly due west on an eastward spinning ball. In actual fact, however, whenever this has been tested, vertically fired cannonballs shoot upwards an average of 14 seconds ascending, 14 seconds descending, and fall back to the ground no more than two feet away from the cannon, sometimes directly back into the muzzle. To account for this problem, globe defenders claim that gravity somehow magically and inexplicably drags the entire lower atmosphere of the Earth in perfect synchronization up to some undetermined height where this progressively faster and faster spinning atmosphere gives way to the non-spinning, non-gravitized, non-atmosphere of supposed infinite vacuum space. NASA refuses to answer at what altitude this impossible feat allegedly happens, but the effect such a transition would have on a craft traversing it would be disastrous. It is also scientifically refuted by the simple fact that vacuums cannot exist connected to non-vacuums while maintaining the properties of a vacuum. As anyone who has punctured an aerosol can knows, two adjacent pressure systems, not separated by some kind of barrier or membrane, will equilibrate. If gravity magically dragged the atmosphere along with the spinning ball earth, that would mean the atmosphere at the poles would be spinning at zero miles per hour, while over the mid-latitudes, it would be spinning around 500 miles per hour, and gradually faster until reaching the equator, where Earth and the atmosphere would be spinning together at over a thousand miles per hour. Not only would this gravitized atmosphere increase speed from poles to the equator, but would also necessarily progressively increase speed the higher the altitude. In reality, however, the atmosphere at every point on Earth is equally unaffected by this alleged force as it has never been measured and is proven non-existent by the ability of airplanes to fly unabated in any direction without experiencing any such atmospheric changes. Landing airplanes on such fast-moving runways, 
facing all manner of directions, north, south, east, west, and otherwise, would also be practically impossible. Not to mention rain, fireworks, birds, bugs, clouds, smoke, balloons, and projectiles would all behave very differently if the Earth and its atmosphere were constantly spinning. Tests were conducted in the 19th century with cannons facing each of the cardinal directions, which proved Earth and its atmosphere are not spinning. If they were, then north and south facing cannons would establish a control, while east firing cannonballs should fall significantly farther than all others, while west firing cannonballs should fall significantly closer. In actual fact, however, regardless of which direction cannons are fired, the distance covered is always the same. Common sense tells us if Earth and its atmosphere were constantly spinning eastwards over a thousand miles per hour, this should somewhere, somehow, be seen, heard, felt, or measured by someone, yet no one in history has ever experienced this alleged eastward motion. Meanwhile, however, we can hear, feel, and experimentally measure even the slightest westward breeze. Furthermore, clouds, wind, and weather patterns casually and unpredictably meander every which way, with clouds often traveling in opposing directions at varying altitudes simultaneously. This is altogether incompatible with the theory of a rapidly rotating Earth and atmosphere. 12. Flight Times If Earth and its atmosphere were constantly spinning eastwards over a thousand miles per hour at the equator, then the average commercial airliner, traveling 500 miles per hour, should never be able to reach its eastward destinations before they come speeding up from behind. Likewise, westward destinations should be arrived at thrice the speed, but this is not the case. In reality, the differences between eastbound and westbound flight durations usually amount to a matter of minutes, and nothing near what would occur on a spinning globe. As Gabrielle Henriette stated in her book Heaven and Earth, if flying had been invented at the time of Copernicus, there is no doubt that he would have soon realized that his contention regarding the rotation of the Earth was wrong, on account of the relation existing between the speed of an aircraft and that of the Earth's rotation. If the Earth rotates, as it is said, at a thousand miles an hour, and a plane flies in the same direction at only five hundred miles, it is obvious that its place of destination will be farther removed every minute. On the other hand, if flying took place in the direction opposite to that of the rotation, a distance of 1,500 miles would be covered in one hour, instead of 500, since the speed of the rotation is to be added to that of the plane. It could also be pointed out that such a flying speed of 1,000 miles an hour, which is supposed to be that of the Earth's rotation, has recently been achieved, so that an aircraft flying at this rate in the same direction as that of the rotation could not cover any ground at all it would remain suspended in mid-air over the spot from which it took off, since both speeds are equal. The spinning globe model dictates that Earth and its atmosphere would be moving together a thousand miles per hour at the equator, and progressively slower, approaching zero closer to the poles. The following examples all take place at the mid-latitudes, where the globe model claims that Earth and its atmosphere should be moving together at approximately 500 miles per hour the same as the average flight speed of a commercial airliner. Flights from Los Angeles to New York City, traveling east with the alleged rotation of the Earth, take an average of five and a half hours, for instance, so the return flight west should only take two and three-quarter hours. But in fact, the average New York City to LA flight actually takes upward of six hours, a time totally inconsistent with the spinning globe model. Flights eastward with the alleged spin of the Earth from Tokyo to Los Angeles take an average of ten and a half hours. Therefore, return flights westward against the alleged spin should take an average of five and a quarter hours, but in actual fact take an average of eleven and a half hours, another flight duration totally inconsistent with the globe model. Eastbound flights from New York to London take an average of seven hours, Therefore, the westbound flights, against the alleged spin, should take an average of three and a half hours, but in reality, they take an average of seven and a half hours. Eastward flights from Chicago to Boston, with the alleged spin of the Earth, take an average of two and a quarter hours. Therefore, the return flights westward, 
against the alleged spin should take an average of just over an hour, but in reality, they take an average of 2.75 hours. Flights eastward from Paris to Rome take an average of two hours. Therefore, the return flights westward against the alleged spin should take only one hour, but in actual fact have an average flight duration of two hours and ten minutes. All of these flight times are impossible on a thousand mile per hour eastward spinning ball, but are consistent with what would be expected over a stationary Earth. 13. Flight Paths If Earth was truly a ball, then there are several flights in the southern hemisphere which would have their quickest, straightest path over the Antarctic continent, such as Santiago, Chile, to Sydney, Australia. Instead of taking the shortest, quickest route in a straight line over Antarctica, however, all such flights detour all manner of directions away from Antarctica, instead claiming the temperatures are too cold for airplane travel. Considering the fact that there are plenty of flights to, from, and over Antarctica, and NASA claims to have technology keeping them in conditions far colder and far hotter than any experienced on Earth, such an excuse is clearly just an excuse, and these flights aren't made because they are impossible. If Earth was a ball, and Antarctica was too cold to fly over, the only logical way to fly from Sydney to Santiago would be a straight shot over the Pacific, staying in the southern hemisphere the entire way. Refueling could be done in New Zealand, or other southern hemisphere destinations along the way, if absolutely necessary. But in reality, Santiago to Sydney flights go into the northern hemisphere, making stopovers at LAX and other North American airports before continuing back down to the southern hemisphere. Such ridiculously wayward detours make no sense on the globe, but make perfect sense and form nearly straight lines when shown on a flat Earth map. On a globe, Johannesburg, South Africa, to Perth, Australia, should be a straight shot over the Indian Ocean, with convenient refueling possibilities on Mauritius or Madagascar. In actual practice, however, most Johannesburg to Perth flights curiously stop over either in Dubai, Hong Kong, or Malaysia, all of which make no sense on the ball model, but are completely understandable when mapped on a flat Earth. On a globe, Cape Town, South Africa, to Buenos Aires, Argentina, should be a straight shot over the Atlantic, following the same line of latitude across. But instead, every flight goes to connecting locations in the Northern Hemisphere first, stopping over anywhere from London to Turkey to Dubai. Once again, these make absolutely no sense on the ball model, but are completely understandable options when mapped on a flat Earth. On a globe, Santiago, Chile, to Johannesburg, South Africa, should be an easy flight, all taking place below the Tropic of Capricorn in the Southern Hemisphere. Yet every listed flight makes a curious refueling stop in Senegal, near the Tropic of Cancer, in the North Hemisphere first. When mapped on a flat Earth, the reason why is clear to see, because Senegal is actually directly in a straight-line path halfway between the two. On a globe, Johannesburg, South Africa, to Sao Paulo, Brazil, should be a quick, straight shot along the 25th southern latitude, but instead, nearly every flight makes a refueling stop at the 50th degree north latitude in London first. The only reason such ridiculous stopovers work in reality is because the Earth is not a spinning ball. 14. Latitude and Longitude If Earth was truly a globe, then every line of latitude south of the equator would have to measure a gradually smaller and smaller circumference the farther south traveled. If Earth is an extended plane, however, then every line of latitude south of the equator should measure a gradually larger and larger circumference the farther south traveled. Practical distance measurements taken from the Australian Handbook, Almanac, Shippers, and Importers Directory state that the straight-line distance between Sydney and Nelson is 1,550 statute miles with a given difference in longitude of 22 degrees, 2 minutes, and 14 seconds. Therefore, if 22 degrees, 2 minutes, and 14 seconds out of 360 degrees is 1,550 miles, the entirety would measure 25,182 miles, which is not only larger than the globe is said to be at the equator, but a whole 4,262 miles greater than it would be at Sydney's southern latitude on a globe of given proportions. 
from near Cape Horn, Chile, to Port Phillip in Melbourne, Australia, the distance is 10,500 miles, or 143 degrees of longitude away. Factoring the remaining degrees to 360 makes for a total distance of 26,430 miles around this particular latitude, which is over 1,500 miles wider than Earth is supposed to be at the equator, and many more thousands of miles wider than it is supposed to be at such southern latitudes. Similar calculations made from the Cape of Good Hope, South Africa, to Melbourne, Australia, at an average latitude of 35.5 degrees south, have given an approximate figure of over 25,000 miles, which is again greater than the Earth's supposed circumference at the equator. Meanwhile, calculations from Sydney, Australia, to Wellington, New Zealand, at an average of 37.5 degrees south, have given an approximate circumference of 25,500 miles, greater still. According to the globe model, the circumference of Earth at 37.5 degrees south latitude should be only 19,757 statute miles, almost 6,000 miles less than such practical measurements. The fact that many captains navigating south of the equator, assuming the globular theory, have found themselves drastically out of reckoning, more so the farther south traveled, also testifies to the fact that the Earth is not a ball. For example, during Captain James Clark Ross's voyages around the Antarctic circumference, he often wrote in his journal perplexed at how they routinely found themselves out of accordance with their charts, stating that they found themselves an average of 12 to 16 miles outside their reckoning every day, later on farther south as much as 29 miles. Lieutenant Charles Wilkes commanded a United States Navy exploration expedition to the Antarctic from 1838 to 1842, and in his journals also mentioned being consistently east of his reckoning, sometimes over 20 miles in less than 18 hours. Quoting Reverend Thomas Milner, In the South Hemisphere, navigators to India have often fancied themselves east of the Cape when still west, and have been driven ashore on the African coast, which, according to their reckoning, lay behind them. This misfortune happened to a fine frigate, the Challenger, in 1845. How came Her Majesty's ship Conqueror to be lost? How have so many other noble vessels, perfectly sound, perfectly manned, perfectly navigated, been wrecked in calm weather, not only in dark night or in a fog, but in broad daylight and sunshine, in the former case upon the coasts, and in the latter upon sunken rocks, from being out of reckoning. The simple answer is that Earth is not a ball. In the globe model, Antarctica is an ice continent which covers the bottom of the ball from 78 degrees south latitude to 90, and is therefore not much more than 12,000 miles in circumference. Many early explorers, including Captain Cook and James Clark Ross, however, in attempting to circumnavigate Antarctica, took upwards of three to four years and clocked between 50,000 and 60,000 miles around. Captain George Nares, on his Challenger expedition, also made an indirect but complete circumnavigation of Antarctica, traversing 69,000 miles, which is entirely inconsistent with the globe model. Hervé Raboni, who circumnavigated the world during the 1993 Whitbread Yacht Race, has recently become a flat earther himself, and claims that the deception is done through the hoax of magnetic declination. Hervé insists that on our flat earth, magnetic declination does not exist, and the addition of this globe-based chart and mathematics to navigation calculations is what keeps pilots and sailors on course. 15. Arctic versus Antarctic If Earth was truly a globe, the Arctic and Antarctic polar regions, and areas of comparable latitude north and south of the equator, should share similar conditions and characteristics, such as comparable temperatures, seasonal changes, length of daylight, plant and animal life. In reality, however, the Arctic and Antarctic regions and areas of comparable latitude north and south of the equator differ greatly in many ways, entirely inconsistent with the globe model, but exactly as expected on a flat Earth. For example, Antarctica is by far the coldest place on Earth, with an average annual temperature of approximately negative 57 degrees Fahrenheit, and a record low of negative 135.8. 
The average annual temperature at the North Pole, however, is a comparatively warm 4 degrees. Throughout the year, temperatures in the Antarctic vary less than half the amount at comparable Arctic latitudes, and the northern Arctic region enjoys moderately warm summers and manageable winters, whereas the southern Antarctic region never even warms enough to melt the perpetual snow and ice. On a tilting, wobbling ball earth, spinning uniformly around the sun, Arctic and Antarctic temperatures and seasons should not vary so greatly. In the Arctic, there are four clearly distinguished seasons, warm summers, and an abundance of plant and animal life, none of which can be said of the Antarctic. The Eskimo also live as far north as the 79th parallel, whereas in the south, no native man is found beyond the 56th. Iceland, at 65 degrees north latitude, is home to 870 species of native plants and abundant various animal life. Compare this with the Isle of Georgia, at just 54 degrees south latitude, where there are only 18 species of native plants, and animal life is almost non-existent. At the same latitude as Canada or England in the north, where dense forests of various tall trees abound, Captain Cook wrote of Georgia that he was unable to find a single shrub large enough to make a toothpick. Cook wrote, Not a tree was to be seen. The lands which lie to the south are doomed by nature to perpetual frigidness, never to feel the warmth of the sun's rays, whose horrible and savage aspect I have not words to describe. Even marine life is sparse in certain tracts of vast extent, and the seabird is seldom observed flying over such lonely wastes. The contrasts between the limits of organic life in the Arctic and Antarctic zones is very remarkable and significant. At places of comparable latitude north and south, the sun also behaves very differently than it should on the globe model, but exactly as expected over a flat earth. For example, in the north, dawn and dusk come slowly and last far longer than in the south, where they come and go very quickly. Certain places in the north, twilight can last for over an hour, while at comparable southern latitudes, within a few minutes the sunlight completely disappears. Also, the longest summer days north of the equator are much longer than those south of the equator, and the shortest winter days north of the equator are much shorter than the shortest south of the equator. These facts are inexplicable on a uniformly spinning, wobbling ball earth, but make perfect sense on a flat earth with a sun traveling faster, wider circles over the south and slower, narrower circles over the north. 16. The Midnight Sun The Midnight Sun is an Arctic phenomenon occurring annually during the summer solstice, where for several days straight, observers north of the Arctic Circle can watch the sun traveling circles overhead, rising and falling throughout the day, but never fully setting for upwards of 72 plus hours. If the Earth was actually a spinning globe revolving around the sun, the only place such a phenomenon as the midnight sun could be observed would be at the poles. Any other vantage point, from 89 degrees latitude downwards, could never, regardless of any tilt or inclination, see the sun for over 24 hours straight. To do so on a spinning globe, at a point other than the poles, you would have to be looking through miles and miles of land and sea for part of the revolution. Some people claim there is a similar phenomenon in Antarctica, but they coincidentally don't have any uncut videos showing this. The few videos available online have been suspiciously edited or manipulated, and the Antarctic Treaty doesn't allow independent explorers to travel there during the winter solstice to verify or refute these claims. Conversely, there are dozens of uncut videos publicly available showing the Arctic midnight sun, and it has been verified beyond any shadow of a doubt as anyone can travel and confirm for themselves. Furthermore, every year from the 71st degree south latitude onwards, the sun sets on May 17th, and is not seen above the horizon again until July 21st. This is totally at odds with the globe model, but easily explained on a flat earth. The midnight sun is seen within the Arctic Circle during summer solstice because the sun, at its innermost cycle, is circling tightly enough around the polar center that it constantly remains visible above the horizon for someone at such a vantage point. Likewise, in extreme southern latitudes during that time, the sun completely disappears from view for over two months because there at the northern tropic, 
at the innermost cycle of its boomerang journey, the sun is circling the northern center too tightly to be seen from the southern circumference. 17. Polaris In the heliocentric model, they claim Earth is a globe spinning a thousand miles per hour around its axis, while revolving tens of thousands of miles per hour around the sun, while the entire solar system circles hundreds of thousands of miles per hour around the Milky Way and the entire galaxy shoots millions of miles per hour more off through infinite space. In reality, no one in history has ever seen, heard, felt, or measured such motions, and everyone can clearly see for themselves that Polaris, the pole star, situated directly over the North Pole center of Earth, never moves night after night, year after year, century after century, with all the other fixed stars remaining fixed in their relative constellations, revolving perfect circles around it. Such circular star trails around an unmoving pole star, seen in time-lapse photos, prove that it is the stars themselves moving, and not the Earth. If Earth was truly a tilting, wobbling, spinning space ball undergoing these multiple contradictory motions through the universe, you would only ever see irregular, random, spiral-shaped star trails and the night sky would never be the same twice. It would be impossible for constellations to exist whatsoever if Earth was truly performing all these various theoretical motions. Quoting 100 Proofs Earth is Not a Globe by William Carpenter, Why in the name of common sense should observers have to fix their telescopes on solid stone bases so that they should not move a hair's breadth if the Earth on which they fix them moves at the rate of 19 miles in a second. Indeed, to believe that 6,000 million 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 tons is rolling, surging, flying, darting on through space forever, with a velocity compared with which a shot from a cannon is a very slow coach, with such unerring accuracy that a telescope fixed on granite pillars in an observatory will not enable a lynx-eyed astronomer to detect a variation in its onward motion of the thousandth part of a hair's breadth, is to conceive a miracle compared with which all the miracles on record put together would sink into utter insignificance. Since we can, in middle north latitudes, see the North Star on looking out of a window that faces it, and out of the very same corner of the very same pane of glass in the very same window all the year round, it is proof enough for any man in his senses that we have made no motion at all, and that the Earth is not a globe. 18. Sigma Octantis Sigma Octantis is claimed to be a southern central pole star similar to Polaris, around which the southern hemisphere stars all rotate around the opposite direction. Unlike Polaris, however, Sigma Octantis cannot be seen simultaneously from every point along the same latitude. It is not central, but allegedly one degree off-center. It is not motionless, and in fact cannot be seen at all using commercially available telescopes. There is legitimate speculation regarding whether Sigma Octantis even exists. The heliocentric model claims stars south of the equator revolve the opposite direction around Sigma Octantis, but in reality, all the luminaries revolve the same direction east to west around Polaris, like in a planetarium dome. Our Earth planetarium, however, is too vast for any observer to see all the stars simultaneously from one vantage point, so their apparent motion, angle, and inclination changes based on perspective and the exact direction faced. Quoting Earth Not a Globe by Dr. Samuel Robotham, Another thing is certain, that from within the equator, the North Pole Star, and the constellations Ursa Major, Ursa Minor, and many others, can be seen from every meridian simultaneously, whereas in the south, from the equator, neither the so-called South Pole Star nor the remarkable constellation of the Southern Cross can be seen simultaneously from every meridian, showing that all the constellations of the South Pole Star included sweep over a great southern arc and across the meridian, from their rise in the evening to their setting in the morning. But if the Earth is a globe, Sigma Octantis, a South Pole Star, and the Southern Cross, a southern circumpolar constellation, they would all be visible at the same time from every longitude on the same latitude, as is the case with the northern pole star and the northern circumpolar constellations. Such, however, 
is not the case. 19. Local Sun Heliocentrists' astronomical figures always sound perfectly precise, but they have historically been notorious for regularly and drastically changing them to suit their various models. For instance, in his time, Copernicus calculated the sun's distance from Earth to be exactly 3,391,200 miles. The next century, Johannes Kepler decided it was actually 12,376,800 miles away. Isaac Newton said during his time that, quote, it matters not whether we reckon it 28 or 54 million miles distant, for either would do just as well. Benjamin Martin calculated between 81 and 82 million miles. Thomas Dilworth claimed 93,726,900 miles. John Hind stated positively 95,298,260 miles. Benjamin Gould said more than 96 million miles, and Christian Mayer thought it was more than 104 million. Nowadays, current heliocentric theorists have settled on a figure of 93 million miles, but all of these ridiculous distances are easily proven wrong by the same method flat earthers have used for centuries. Measuring with sextants and calculating with plain trigonometry, both the sun and moon figure to be only approximately 30 miles in diameter and less than 3,000 miles away. Furthermore, amateur balloon footage taken above the clouds has provided stunning visual proof that the sun cannot be millions of miles away. In several shots, you can see a clear hot spot reflecting on the clouds directly below the sun's spotlight-like influence. If the sun were actually millions of miles away, such a small, localized hot spot could not occur. Another proof the sun is not millions of miles away is found by tracing the angle of sun rays back to their source above the clouds. There are countless pictures and videos showing how sunlight comes down through cloud cover at a variance of converging angles. The area of convergence is of course the sun, and is clearly not millions of miles away, but rather relatively close to Earth. The fact that the sun and moon's reflections on water always form a straight-line path from the horizon all the way to the observer also proves Earth is not a ball. If Earth's surface was curved, it would be impossible for the reflected light to bend over the ball. 20. Scientific Experiments Several experiments have been performed and repeated by notable scientists like Albert Mickelson, Edward Morley, George Airy, and George Sagnac, proving that it is the stars that revolve around a stationary Earth and not the other way around. The conclusive results of their experiments are not contested or even mentioned in modern astronomy books, but rather conveniently swept under the carpet to keep prying minds from seeing through the lies. For example, the experiment known as Aries Failure, since it failed to confirm heliocentricity, proved that the stars move relative to a stationary Earth, and not the other way around. By first filling a telescope with water to slow down the speed of light inside, then calculating the tilt necessary to get the starlight directly down the tube, Airy failed to prove the heliocentric theory, since the starlight was already coming in the correct angle, with no change necessary, and instead proved the geocentric model. The Mickelson-Morley, Mickelson-Gale, and Sagnac experiments also attempted to measure the change in speed of light due to Earth's assumed motion through space. After measuring in every possible different direction in various locations, they all failed to detect any significant change whatsoever, again proving the stationary geocentric model. Suffice to say, these 20 points are just scratching the surface, and there are many, many more proofs available, both in William Carpenter's book, 100 Proofs, Earth is Not a Globe, and my own book, 200 Proofs, Earth is Not a Spinning Ball.